My name is Murray Levin. If you're up front, you can read that right on the card. And I'm very uh, pleased and honored to be hosting a very distinguished panel. Now technology, love it or hate it or leave it, you can't escape it. And there are at least two things that I can think of about technology. One is that it is moving faster and faster. And another thing is that, as with most innovation, there are a lot of good things, but there are also some bad things. Now, we're going to try to consider how to increase access to justice by using artificial intelligence. And again, uh, just based on a few personal ideas, when I think of technology and the law, I start out as a young lawyer going to court with one briefcase with maybe 50 pages of paper. And that was the case. And every word on all 50 pages was up here. By the time a couple of decades went by, when I went to court, I had to bring an assistant who had some contraption that went through the database of a million pages. And that was in a relatively short time. And I can promise you that from this point on, we're moving at warp speed. And that's going to seem like child's play. Now, a lot of us have heard about some of the bad stuff surrounding artificial intelligence. How many people read about the case in New York where one of the parties produced a fantastic brief to the court? It came up with four or five cases which in the common law were right on point, practically guaranteed that he would win. They were too good to be true, some people said. And in fact, they weren't true. The chat box made them up. The judge didn't like that too much once he found out. And the last I heard, that particular lawyer was pleading to maintain his role as a bar member. So that's the bad side. How about good side? I mentioned that when I started practicing, I could easily imagine myself going for a fairly important case with 50 pages of paper. In some of my more recent cases, and I'm not exaggerating, there were 10 million pages. It didn't really matter. We didn't read the 10 million. We got together with the judge, and we fought with the various parties to select five key words, which the computer and the artificial intelligence used for the purpose of sorting through 10 million pages and coming up with the 50 that I used to carry in the briefcase. So now, I've said enough to just get us started, I hope. Uh, the real meat of this program is sitting on either side of me, and we're very, very lucky to have these people. Uh, what I propose to do, since I'm right-handed, I'll start from my right, and we'll move through the four speakers. And after each one speaks, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll try to recognize you. You're an important part of this program. So don't just sit there like a bump on the log. And when we get through the whole four presentations, 
we'll engage in an internal discussion which can involve you as well. So to start with, to my right, is Julian Kavar Uganda, and he is from Kigali, Rwanda. He has a very interesting biography, very distinguished. He's the immediate past president of the Rwanda Bar. He also is a past president of the Bar Association of the Great Lakes. When I read that, I thought we were talking about Lake Superior, Lake Huron in the US, but it turns out that it's actually Rwanda, Burundi, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, Julian has been practicing law for some 20 years in corporate areas like M&A and uh, joint ventures. And uh, he's an important lawyer in Rwanda who's called upon to consult on major projects such as the new international airport in Kigali, such as stadiums that are being built. And uh, many of you are probably familiar with the various chambers guides, and he is listed as an outstanding lawyer in the chambers global guide. So without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Julian, and I'm gonna ask him to tell us a little bit about what is happening in Rwanda in general with artificial intelligence, and in addition, specifically, how they are attempting to increase access to justice. Julian. Thank you, David. Uh, I will be speaking in, in English, but mainly in Rwanda for what is being, the development has been beginning with uh, the online access to the justice system meaning that you cannot longer in Rwanda access to justice with paper. You have to submit your documentation to the court using uh, uh, the online system of the judiciary. You also have access to, to the justice for preparing the hearing and the uh, written submission and the decision of court, you, you being informed by email. So the iPad and the system is now allowing the next step of having the artificial intelligence being used by lawyers to have uh, a kind of insights on what can be the potential result from uh, the judge on a particular case because all the list, all the decision of the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court are now available online. This is allowing uh, the judiciary in Rwanda and the, fratern the legal fraternity to be able to plan ahead and uh, have a system that can be able to analyze a decision that has been uh, made on a particular case and decide what can be the ultimate decision that can come up with uh, uh, the judiciary in Rwanda. So the system is also allowing lawyers to plan ahead and uh, have a similar case that has been judged by the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeal and be able to say, okay, from this decision of the Supreme Court of Rwanda, they did X, I'm planning that uh, with the same element, the decision of the court or the damages to be allowed by the court is most or uh, may be likely to be X amount. So those, those element is now allowing us as uh, lawyers and the legal fraternity to know, okay, what do I do? What is the planning? How long it can take? And the situation can also allow us to spend less hour preparing a case. The artificial intelligence saying uh, there is those who are close that you using you paying for usage. There's also the open chat GPT, etc. I've been also testing the system now and uh, asking my kid of 12 years to give me what is chat, chat GPT saying about access to justice and uh, and artificial intelligence. And for Rwanda, there was a list of all pros and cons and it was matching with the presentation I've been making and the preparation of my uh, associate. So the idea is that it can be accurate, and as the previous panel, uh, panel has been explaining, even for Rwanda, is that this case of access to justice is that lawyers can have access to a tool, to a system, that is allowing us to spend less hours 
for the same level of quality to be presented to clients. It's allowing us to give more pro bono services, specifically for Rwanda. Each law firm has a mandatory duty to give two cases pro bono per year. So that is part of uh, the CLA point, the credit that you have to, to have per year to have your certificate renewed each and every year. So by end of November in Rwanda, by the Rwanda Bar Association, each lawyer will be presenting the number of training he has been participating in, like I will be presenting them my certificate of attending this meeting, that will be having a certain number of credit. I can also present the pro bono cases I've been using. Those pro bono cases is, uh, if I have uh, access to letters you have been drafting for people, written submission you have been doing, it means if I was spending 20 hours for pro bono services with the AI, just verifying and not using my associate for that, I can also provide a very uh, quality service, legal services to the pro bono, to the people who need uh, to have legal services without paying for it. So it's, uh, it's, a re it's one of the way to have access to justice using the artificial intelligence. I don't have to use resources of the law firm. I can use the artificial intelligence system that we have in the law firm for that purpose. But the other idea is that even the judiciary system will be using it, making it efficient for judges to, uh, to spend less hours for delivering justice. One of the issues we have uh, with the judiciary is that it could take six months to one year for a commercial court to make a decision. That, uh, and the Supreme Court is willing to reduce it to three months instead of one year uh, period. Each judge is supposed to have 20 decisions being uh, issued per month. Having, um, and there is a system, because all decisions are being done within the online system, the system can identify as a report for the chief justice and the, the judiciary, uh, the council of the judiciary, who is the judge who is uh, performant, who is the judge who, has, uh, who is issuing his decision very late and very often, and that could be a, a reason for sanction. Having a judge issuing 20 cases per month, not using the artificial intelligence, is delaying the process. And justice denied is a justice, uh, just delay, delayed is justice denied. One of the reasons of uh, introducing now in Rwanda uh, an artificial intelligence system is that, first of all, the, the system being online, having the decision of the judiciary available also online, the website of the Supreme Court is allowing an artificial intelligence to give to the judges a draft, a possible draft of uh, a judgment on a particular case. Then the duty of the judge will be to verify and decide if that decision is matching with what he was planning, with the hearing he has been having and the information and documentation submitted to him. Those will be facilitating issu uh, issuing a decision that is a, of a high quality and in less time than previously. So that is what we assume to have for now. And what also is, uh, is to have efficient decision, quick decision, with the verification that is planned by the inspector of the judiciary, or that is a committee of judges, senior judges at the level of the Supreme Court, that we'll be able to ensure that the quality of judge judgment is of high level, and there is still a level of appeal when needed, but that, that is supposed to be enhancing the, the quality of the judiciary, the quality of decision being made by the judges. Be, having it online, it's also enhancing our, uh, the access to what is uh, a planned decision by a judge, and it's also allowing us to make it cheap. Make it cheap, it means that being in different jurisdiction of the country, I don't need to be uh, in Kigali to be able to have access to the system. I can be in the rural area, I only need access to internet, which is by the advantage of having a small country, it means that access to internet is all over the different district of the country and different jurisdiction. And each lawyer has a duty with the pro bono services that if uh, somebody who, who has no means of uh, accessing or paying a cyber coffee, who reach an office of the lawyer, he has a duty to help and assist that person for in using his online system or his assistant to, to check what is the situation of his case in court or to introduce the case in, in the name on, on behalf of that person. 
with the means of a budget provided by the Bar Association. So those are the element with the online system and then the artificial intelligence coming for lawyers to, to allow access to justice that is efficient and allowing people who didn't have the money to access the judiciary and access the lawyer to be able to do it. Because the, what the lawyer can be able to do in a very short period of time is now possible. It, it was not possible in, before COVID, but COVID has been allowing to have online hearing with the judiciary and uh, using the, the system as Skype, Zoom, Microsoft Teams with the judiciary to be able to have a hearing where the lawyer or the client may be in one district, the judge in another district, and uh, different people intervening, even being outside the country. So I can intervene in a court case uh, tomorrow morning when I'm sitting in Rome, and the case is happening when the judge is sitting in Kigali. So they don't need to know where I am, and that is the online system allowing the next step of the artificial intelligence. I will be maybe using the time I have for, for question afterwards, but it's a good tool that is being used, and we hope it will be working well. It has, of course, some limitation, but so far, so good. Thank you. Th Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, everybody in the room now, let's not let the court in Kigali know that Julian is here, remember. <laughs> now, uh, I'll take the moderator's uh, prerogative to ask you a question or two while others in the audience may be thinking of them. And uh, you mentioned open uh, versus paid for AI. Is there any concern with the quality or reliability of the open system? Uh, reliability of the open system, again, is, uh, uh, it's limited because wherever, when the system is free, it means that uh, uh, there is a problem to be considered. You have to be checking the quality to avoid the situation of the New York case and the New York lawyer, but that is the duty of the lawyer and uh, the law firm. But for the, un the other one that is paid for, there is that uh, check that is being made and you're paying for it. When it's something is free, it means sometimes that the product is you. So we have to be careful with that. Two quick points. Uh, you discussed how pro bono could work and how AI can help there. If I'm an individual in Kigali and I can't afford a lawyer, can I, by getting access to AI, find a lawyer who will represent me for either free or very low? Uh, yes, so each, there is 30 districts in Rwanda and each district has at least three lawyers that are committed for pro bono services. They are paid by the Rwanda Bar Association, but there is also additional people who are having uh, extra services paid by other partners like USAID, UNHCR for refugees, and there is also some people having a budget from UNDP to help access to justice in each and every district, including access to the online system, and, uh, and those people will be able to use so far, many of them are, can use the open AI, but uh, when the means are coming and uh, if we reduce the, the budget to acquire uh, the, the closed open AI, those who are, you have to pay for it, and that is the duty of the Bar Association to make sure that the 1,500 lawyers we have in town can have a, uh, uh, an, a system that is, that is paid by the Bar Association, so make it cheap for each individual around $100 for accessing that system. Thank you. I see a question in the back. Um, bueno, um, thank you. In introduce yourself, please. I'm Angelica from Munich, lawyer from Munich, Bavaria, and I have a second admission uh, in Naples, in Italy. I want to know uh, if it is possible uh, in Rwanda to replace the decision of a human judge by an algorithm judge, uh, by a technical decision. Thank you. If we can replace a judge by uh, a robotic or a system. 
uh, no, and uh, we hope it will not happen. So, <laughs> as we also consider that lawyers are needed, even if we have, uh, it's the system, it's a tool we should be using. We are not hoping that judges will be replaced. Judges are needed because there is a context, there is a, a, a situation that is depending on each person, so the justice system should not be uh, acting as a robot. A criminal case where you need a judge to understand the story, the facts, and put the law in place. So the tool and the system, artificial intelligence, will be just helping to fast track, because judges are not having, in Europe, you may have uh, each and every judge having two assistants helping to draft. In, in Africa, especially for Rwanda, they don't have those kind of uh, assistants. So having that tool, replacing that human being, doesn't stop having a judge as a physical person. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. That is actually a very hot topic, at least academically. And a number of articles have been written on the fact that if you go to having AI making the decision, and let's say it's limited to commercial, we're not going to do murder trials and so forth, but you still have the problem of built-in biases based on the database that is created. And I think that's maybe what you were getting at. I saw another hand. We'll take one more question and then, uh, yes, right, right over here. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Je réponds au de Justin Lubo, avocat au barreau de Kinshasa Gombe. Euh, J'ai suivi euh, l'exposé très, très, très euh, euh, important. Et euh, c'est une expérience qui, qui, doit, qui, qui doit inspirer aussi d'autres pays, en l'occurrence euh, notre pays. Euh, je crois que c'est vraiment une très bonne expérience. Mais j'ai une préoccupation. Vous le savez bien, bien euh, confrère, que la, la justice en ligne présente de nombreux avantages, c'est vrai. Euh, mais il est essentiel de garantir aussi la protection des données à caractère personnel, notamment en ce qui concerne l'effacement des informations liées à d'anciennes décisions judiciaires réformées. Lorsqu'une décision judiciaire est réformée, il est important de veiller à ce que les informations correspondantes soient supprimées afin de ne pas être utilisé contre la personne concernée. Et donc, la confidentialité des données est une préoccupation majeure dans le domaine de la justice en ligne. Et des mesures doivent être prises ou mises en place pour s'assurer que des informations personnelles des individus soient traitées de manière appropriée. Maintenant, je voudrais savoir, euh, au niveau du Rwanda, est-ce que il y a une réglementation qui a été mise en place pour encadrer la gestion des données à caractère personnel dans le cadre de la justice en ligne. Parce qu'il est important de pouvoir trouver un équilibre entre la transparence de la justice en ligne et la protection des données à caractère personnel. Les, les individus ont droit de savoir ce qui a été décidé dans une affaire judiciaire mais cela ne devrait pas se faire au détriment de leur vie privée et leur réputation. Merci beaucoup. Yeah, thank you for your question. And uh, Julian, before you answer it, for those who may not have been listening on earphones or may not speak French as well as our uh, questioner, uh, basically we're talking about protection of private data on online uh, in the various areas that Julian has already discussed. And Julian, if you could give a, just a quick answer on how this is handled in Rwanda. Okay, I can respond in French. Sure. Okay, donc euh, la question du, du confrère Justin, du barreau de Kinshasa Gombe, c'est le caractère donc euh, de la protection de la vie privée, c'est que la décision qui sont rendues publiques sont les décisions de la Cour d'appel ou de la Cour suprême, sur le site de la Cour suprême. C'est-à-dire que c'est des décisions qui sont normalement passées en force de ce sujet et qui sont définitifs. Donc il n'y a plus de degré d'appel et c'est des décisions qui ont, aussi, qui ont aussi été vérifiées par une certaine comi comité avec des juges de la Cour d'appel, des juges de la Cour suprême, des euh, enseignants de l'Université de droit du Rwanda et l'Institut 
de pratique professionnelle de l'Institut de Legal Practice and Development. Donc, ce comité-là vérifie les décisions qui sont considérées comme des jurisprudences dans des domaines particuliers et ayant la force de choses jugées, et étant dans le domaine public, puisque les décisions sont rendues publiquement. Et c'est ça qui garantit que la protection de la vie privée euh, n'est pas, euh, pas un frein et que la, la décision qui pourrait changer uniquement s'il y avait une révision éventuelle ou s'il y avait une, un cas d'injustice, parce que quand il y a un cas d'injustice considéré par l'Ombudsman du Rwanda, ça peut retourner à la Cour suprême pour être changé. Dans ce cas-là, cette décision-là sera enlevée du site Internet et remplacée par la décision d'injustice euh, qui, qui aura été rendue par après par la, de, euh, par la Cour d'appel ou la Cour suprême, selon le degré qui avait rendu la décision en dernier ressort. Donc, euh, les droits sont protégés pour les, les parties ou les personnes intervenant dans le dossier. Si c'est des cas pénals, il y a toujours la protection aussi des témoins qui sont informés avec des codes, et c'est toujours dans le jugement, c'est le code de la personne qui est mentionné et pas le nom de la personne, toujours pour la protection des données. Merci. J'espère que j'ai répondu à la question. Uh, thank you very much, you did indeed, and thank you for your presentation. And now we're going to move from Rwanda to England and Wales. And I can't think of a better person from England and Wales to talk to us than the Vice President of the Law Society of England and Wales, Richard Atkinson, who is sitting right next to me. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember the uh, book and movie about six degrees of separation. I don't know why I'm thinking about it, but it may have something to do with the fact that Richard's practice is as a criminal defense lawyer. And he told me that he has defended more than 30 people accused of murder. Now, they weren't all convicted, but anyway, uh, six degrees of separation, that's not that comfortable. But uh, Richard, I'm going to ask you to give us an overview of how England and Wales are incorporating artificial intelligence in promoting access to judgment, access to justice. I understand it's maybe more of a work in progress. It may be something that we're looking into the future, but we count on you to guide us there. Thank you very much. Um, well. Th thank you for having me here uh, at this UIA Congress in Rome to speak about as interesting a subject as access to justice through AI. Uh, I will talk a little bit about this from an English and Welsh perspective, uh, although I imagine that there are similarities between many jurisdictions. Uh, we at the Law Society of England and Wales are excited by the prospect of how AI advancement can be used by legal professionals to make their work more efficient and to make the lives of their clients easier. AI's potential to increase access to justice deserves special attention. And our three-year 21st century justice project that explores practical changes to make sure the system works effectively is examining questions such as how do we ensure the online justice system works for justice users and the profession? And how can we ensure case outcome predictive software enables and protects access to justice? AI has the potential to greatly improve accessibility in the comprehension of English law. For example, natural language processing technology can simplify existing legal texts for users and break down legal jargon and complex language into layman's terms. This makes it easier for people to understand their rights, their responsibilities, and their legal position. AI can play a role in helping people find the right sources for advice for their situation whereas without it, they might not know where to start. We all know how complicated the law can be. AI may make it easier for the public to get a general idea of what advice they might need and how they can go about finding it. For the lawyers, AI means that legal professionals can work with greater efficiency and accuracy so that the speed and quality of their services improve through automation, thereby facilitating more people to access legal advice. However, while we embrace the improvements that AI can bring to our work, we also need to be cautious that we maintain the human aspects of legal practice 
and don't let AI take over the processes that really need to be done by human lawyers. Lawyers cannot be replaced, and we need to be careful about how reliant people become on AI for access to justice. While AI might be able to signpost people to where they can get the best support and give them a very basic understanding as to their legal position, it absolutely cannot replace legal advice given by lawyers. We have the knowledge, expertise, and skill set that allows us to provide the context and advice that goes beyond the black letter law. We can identify nuances that clients need and also be flexible, adaptable, and creative in a way that technology cannot be. Empathy is absolutely crucial to those who pass through the justice system and need not only legal, but also psychological or emotional support. Trust can only be established by developing human relationships over a sustained period of time. This is not an experience that can be replaced by technology. It is also important to talk about regulation. Whilst on the one hand it's great to see startups and innovators creating legal technology for those that cannot afford traditional legal services, these services may be unregulated and performed by non-legal professionals. They may give incorrect advice, which can end up being really dangerous. They may also not have the same robust redress processes that regulated lawyers and law firms have, meaning consumers have nowhere to turn if things go wrong. As a profession, with support from government and policymakers, we need to make a balance between supporting AI and tools that offer accessible, on-demand advice, while ensuring that these new services are regulated. There are existing rights in the General Data Protection Regulation to protect against automated decision-making, as well as requirements for data protection impact assessments on high-risk and special category data. However, these regulations and rights need to be updated and strengthened in the changing context of emerging AI technologies. For example, we need to contemplate the challenges related to the digital footprint of offenders who have already served their sentences. Everything is a simple online search away, and there are currently no data rights in this space. The right to erasure does not extend so far as to remove such information on offenders. We need to be thinking about how we can legislate around these issues. There is plenty for both legal professionals and lawmakers to consider before we fully welcome AI with open arms, and it is right that we take a cautious approach to the utilization of such technologies. Different technologies work for different people, and careful consideration is needed to ensure that the design, development, and deployment of digital technologies and AI systems are both necessary and appropriate. I think it's also important to point out that we cannot rely on AI to provide access to justice. All the benefits I have mentioned today can only be seen as a few of many tools we use to improve access to justice. Certainly in the UK, restoring the availability of legal aid by investing in it monetarily remains a priority. Whilst AI might be a money saver in some legal areas, it certainly isn't paying the fees of legal aid practitioners. In the UK then, we charge lawmakers to work with us in evaluating what a healthy relationship between AI and access to justice might be, whilst also find funding the more traditional methods of ensuring access to justice. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Richard, for that thoughtful overview. Uh, you touched on uh, an interesting point when you mentioned predictive software. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that. Could you foresee a time when an individual, not a lawyer, may feel they have been harmed in some way and puts the basic facts into some type of program and the program tells him or her that that is not likely to be successful in court and therefore no cases filed or in another uh, area I might envision it gives support to the notion of the injury suffered by the individual and they might then show it to the 
potential defendant, and it might lead to a settlement, which also might be a good thing for the legal system. In other words, how can predictive software, as you envision it, work going forward, and where are some new areas it might lead us? Um, well, that's, that's a very good question, and, and, and we're at a very early stage, and as you say, there's a, there's a degree of, of looking into the future here, but it can certainly uh, reduce the cost of legal advice, uh, as we've talked about. Uh, it can help make better informed decisions, as you say, uh, and um, it can help consumers to avoid litigation um, if, it, if given the um, correct advice. The problem is whether or not the advice that they're given by artificial intelligence is correct and the source that they will use to find that. Uh, and we've talked uh, in the earlier session about open and closed um, AI systems. Uh, and clearly there is a risk that if we are talking about individuals as opposed to companies uh, or those seeking commercial advice, that they will go to online open um, systems for advice. Uh, and there is a real risk that the advice they get may not be right. We've heard how it may not be up to date. Uh, it will also have um, baked in some um, previous um, biases that will have come uh, which may make it very dangerous. And of course, the more it's used, it then seeks to, it perpetuates uh, the advice that's given because that then goes back online, they then search online, uh, and, and so it perpetuates the situation. So there are real risks, and that's where the issue of regulation uh, of those providing that advice uh, comes in very, very much so. So benefits, yes, but, but a degree of caution as well. Okay, let's see any hands in the audience, and I'll ask one more question while you're thinking of your questions. Uh, you mentioned toward the end of your remarks that in the end it was needed to work with the legislature to come up with new laws, new regulations. Where, what do you think uh, are the areas that need attention from our elected legislators? Uh, we, we, we've got to look at um, protecting um, people's rights. One, one thing that we know uh, very much about matters online, and it's not just with AI, is that once it's there, it's there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's easily traced and found. Uh, and protecting people's privacy and rights is really important. Uh, so we need to work with the legislature to look at that. Uh, we also need to look at work with the legislature on providing uh, the right regulation for those offering advice at the moment um, we have uh, restricted rights uh, to provide legal advice uh, and you have to be a qualified lawyer, but once you can go to AI, then who, anyone can provide that. And so we need to work with the legislature to work out how we can protect people's rights in an online um, advice situation. Encore, le, encore la semaine dernière, un de nos avocats, un de nos jeunes avocats disait, moi j'ai mis en place un robot et que je fais travailler avec les informations que je, que je lui donne euh, toutes les semaines, tous les jours, et, 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 et en cela, c'est extrêmement intéressant, la façon dont nos jeunes avocats, mais aussi nos, nos cabinets, se sont emparés de ces outils, mais avec une extrême précaution. Et cette extrême précaution, elle est d'une part de ne jamais omettre le devoir de compétence des avocats, deux, de veiller au respect de la question de, du secret professionnel, hein, c'est-à-dire que l'intelligence artificielle générative, qui, pour fournir une réponse pertinente, va nécessiter la collecte d'un très grand nombre de données, mais dont certaines, attention, sont couvertes par le secret professionnel. Et enfin, ce sont des garanties techniques et juridiques qui doivent être mises en œuvre pour protéger nos clients, et protéger la confidentialité des échanges entre les avocats et, et, les cli et leurs clients. Et c'est en cela, c'est indispensable pour la relation de confiance. Donc, nous avons en Europe un règlement, un, un, un e-act, Intelligence Act, euh, qui est en cours euh, actuellement, qui va veiller à tous ces éléments. Et puis, c'est à nous, institutions ordinales, un, d'aider à la formation de nos avocats, deux, aux outils, mais aussi d'assurer la sécurité déontologique. Et en cela, il nous appartient à nos yeux, euh, et ce n'est pas un hasard si 
euh, et permettez-moi deux minutes de publicité euh, pour le congrès qui se tiendra à Paris l'année prochaine de l'Union internationale des avocats, où le thème est tout simplement euh, sur l'intelligence artificielle et de voir le thème principal va être « Faut-il ou peut-on réguler l'intelligence artificielle ?» Et donc, moi, je vous invite, puisque vous êtes ici et vous êtes tous passionnés par cela, et ce sont des sujets passionnants, à d'ores et déjà nous rejoindre l'année prochaine à Paris, euh, puisque nous aurons, euh, le barreau français aura l'honneur d'accueillir le Congrès international des avocats. Voilà, votre disposition pour répondre à toutes vos interrogations. Juste un tout petit point, parce que une question, la question a été posée tout à l'heure, de dire que tout ceci, euh, chez nous en France, se passe sous le contrôle de la CNIL, euh, et nous, veux, nous souhaitons euh, que tout ceci soit contrôlé, là encore, sur la sécurité juridique de nos clients. Donc l'intelligence artificielle, emparons-nous, bien sûr, mais veillons à ce que, tant à l'utilisation qu'en est faite, tant par nos avocats et surtout par nos juges et nos gouvernements. Thank you, Maria. Me. Uh, I accept your invitation to Paris. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> you didn't have to twist my arm. Um, I, I want to ask you this. Uh, do you think that we lawyers have too high an opinion of ourselves that we're too proud? Now, uh, let, let me just look for a moment at the medical profession. Uh, I recently read that a uh, experiment was undertaken by radiologists. A uh, hundred x-rays were read by live, real-life doctors who then rendered their diagnosis. And the same hundred x-rays were read by an artificial intelligence system. It turned out that the artificial intelligence system had a much higher rate of success in reading and diagnosing. And I'm just wondering, we're talking about, well, we need to have humans, we can't have art, we can't have AI make legal decisions. Uh, and I'm just asking you, do you think uh, maybe we ought to reconsider it? Bah, tout simplement, derrière toute intelligence artificielle, il y a des hommes. Il y a des hommes et des principes éthiques, et c'est en cela qu'il nous appartient à nous de veiller au respect de ces principes éthiques qui soit le respect des droits fondamentaux, le principe de non-discrimination, parce que vous pouvez biaiser l'intelligence artificielle, euh, notamment un policier qui arrête euh, une personne parce que, euh, au vu de son sexe, de son origine euh, euh, ou autre, euh, la qualité et la sécurité dans le traitement des données, et enfin la transparence, la neutralité et l'intégrité intellectuelle. Donc en cela... Euh, si on compare avec la médecine, euh, ça va être comment utiliser cette intelligence artificielle. Et on le fait. Et d'ailleurs, ce n'est pas pour rien que euh, nos jeunes s'en sont saisis. Enfin, on, on a créé un incubateur. Euh, on, a, on crée des incubateurs, un incubateur national. Euh, je vois euh, nos amis belges. On a, nous avons créé un, un incubateur européen aussi avec eux, de façon à, à contribuer au développement. Et dans les écoles de formation des barreaux, aussi de veiller à ce qu'il y ait une formation à l'intelligence artificielle, parce que ben, c'est comme, comme hier, ne, ne, pas, ne pas utiliser Internet euh, pourrait nous être reproché. Et, et c'est vrai que la question des diagnostics faussés euh, qui sont meilleurs par l'intelligence artificielle pour les médecins, c'est incroyable, un, absolument un, époustouflant. Okay. Des questions. Thank you. OK, uh, this gentleman right here. Stand up and wait for the mic. And then this woman, your second. Okay. Thank you. Merci. Uh, je suis Prosper Ntetika, avocat au barreau de Kinshasa Gombe, République démocratique du Congo, et conseiller juridique du ministre du numérique de la RDC. Ma question uh, repose au sujet du cadre de gouvernance. Au niveau du Conseil national de barreaux, 
Comment vous entendez, euh, comment vous envisagez le cadre de gouvernance, surtout en ce qui concerne la confidentialité et toutes les règles professionnelles de l'avocat Qu'est-ce qui va arriver demain lorsque nous serons dans une situation euh, euh, conflictuelle avec la loi et où on sera en même temps devant une question professionnelle, par exemple une violation de la confidentialité, et où il s'avérait que la même question relèverait aussi d'une autre autorité de régulation, en l'occurrence les régulateurs, qui viendra peut-être demain de l'intelligence artificielle. Comment est-ce que le Conseil national de barreaux entend envisager la démarcation des compétences sur les questions qui sont des questions technique et la réserve des questions qui sont d'ordre professionnel et qui relèvent des instances ordinales. Merci. Votre question est passionnante euh, et, et ma réponse va être simple en, en ce qui nous concerne et, et je parle sous le contrôle des autres membres du Conseil national des barreaux qui sont dans, dans cette salle, c'est tout simplement euh, qu'il n'y a qu'une déontologie et qu'il nous appartient de veiller à ce que les règles soient respectées. Dans cet exemple de l'avocat américain euh, qui n'est pas allé vérifier les données, c'est un devoir de compétence et un devoir de vérifier les sources euh, que l'on produit devant une juridiction. Hein. Comme tout avocat, hein, souvenez-vous, il fut un temps où d'ailleurs devant les tribunaux, il fallait donner une copie papier du livre et non pas euh, une base de données. Et euh, en cela, il appartient à nos ordres ensuite d'assurer la discipline et aux bâtonniers de poursuivre s'il si y a rédaction d'un faux jugement ou, comme cela a été fait, invoquer des jurisprudences qui n'existent pas. Donc pour nous, il n'y a aucune difficulté au sens où les réseaux sociaux, nous avons déjà l'exemple des réseaux sociaux qui ont totalement chamboulé la communication des avocats, qui ont complètement chamboulé, pourrait-on penser, l'exercice et, et l'expression de l'avocat euh, sur les réseaux sociaux. Il n'en demeure pas moins que nous avons une seule et même déontologie et c'est notre règlement intérieur national euh, qui s'applique. Après, il nous appartient, et ça c'est l'objet de réflexion de notre commission règles et usages, de voir s'il faut que, adapter à l'intelligence artificielle aussi notre déontologie, comme nous l'avons adapté entre guillemets sur les réseaux sociaux, mais pour nous, il y a une seule et même déontologie qui s'applique, et quelles que soient les institutions, et ce n'est pas parce que ça relève d'une autre autorité, de toutes les façons, l'autorité euh, des, des ordres reste la même. Euh, C'est-à-dire que nous avons un avocat qui peut très bien être poursuivi pénalement, ce n'est pas pour autant qu'il ne le sera pas disciplinairement, puisque nous sommes sur des sanctions qui sont distinctes, un sur la faute pénale et l'infraction pénale, et l'autre sur le manquement disciplinaire pour lequel il sera également sanctionné. Jean-Pierre Biel. Point very well taken, Marie Ami. We cannot overemphasize the role of legal ethics in our dealings with artificial intelligence. Now, this woman was called upon. Wait for the microphone, please. Here it comes. Muy buenas tardes. Eh, soy la doctora Sonia Hilario de Lima, Perú. Eh, estoy co completamente de acuerdo con el ponente de Inglaterra de que la máquina no puede reemplazar al hombre, pero eh, relacionado con el comentario de que eh, la inteligencia artificial eh, ayuda en la base de datos, pero jamás, de los jamases, va a reemplazar a la decisión en criterio de conciencia y sapiencia y las características del imputado en una sentencia penal que se juega la vida al hombre. Y en la materia civil es un riesgo tremendo porque en el mundo entero se discute el patrimonio y aquí sería pues una falla total porque ya la máquina reemplazaría al hombre y eso no lo debemos permitir. Los abogados defensores de la vida del hombre, de su libertad, y del resultado de sentencias donde se va a jugar patrimonios, donde en mi país se dice que el pez gordo se lo come al chico, y eso no se debe permitir. Eh, yo lo que me quedé con la mano en alto, doctor Murray, 
que no me la dio la palabra Hernández, era que tenía una duda con relación a, a Ruanda. Solamente quería que me haga ese alcance, doctor, en el sentido de que en qué momento no procede la, la apelación de la sentencia, porque la apelación de la sentencia es un derecho fundamental. Y usted llegó a decir, salvo que yo no haya entendido, de que no procedía la apelación de una sentencia. ¿En qué casos no procede la apelación? ¿Cuando la máquina lo resuelve o cuando lo decide el, el, el presidente de la sala o el juez o el judice? Thank you, Julian. Oh, en, concernant l'appel, c'est que le système judiciaire reste le même. C'est juste une facilité qui est donnée à, au juge. C'est juste une facilité qui est donnée au juge d'utiliser l'artificial intelligence pour avoir une idée d'une décision judiciaire à rendre. Mais sinon, le degré d'appel reste valable. Au Rwanda, on a toujours les mêmes degrés d'appel qui est le tribunal de première instance, le, la haute cour et ensuite une possibilité de deuxième appel au niveau de la cour d'appel. Et il y a même une, euh, un autre appel qui a été prévu en cas d'injustice euh, qui est suscité par une autre institution qui s'appelle euh, euh, l'organe de l'Ombudsman qui permet à vérifier s'il y a un cas de décision rendue en dernier ressort par une juridiction mais qu'avec des informations qui viendraient à être mises à leur disposition, ils demandent à la Cour suprême d'ordonner qu'une autre juridiction qui soit à la Cour d'appel rejuge euh, cette décision-là sur base d'injustice. Mais ça, c'est un cas exceptionnel. Donc, il y a plus ou moins, au moins deux degrés d'appel et la voie extraordinaire qui est prévue d'un cas d'injustice. Donc, euh, je vous rassure que le droit d'appel reste valable, même avec l'artificial intelligence. Merci. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, I think we have to continue our trip, not quite around the world, but uh, we moved from Africa, we went across the English Channel, and now let's see if we can move all the way over to Asia, and we're quite fortunate to have the uh, president of the Law Society of Hong Kong. Uh, C.M. Chan, who is the president, uh, has a very distinguished career, uh, he spent a number of years as an in-house counsel for a multinational energy company, and he is uh, a specialist in wealth management. Uh, he's close to 30 years practicing there. I don't know much about wealth or wealth management, so I'm quite in awe, and he's going to lead us to a consideration of AI, artificial intelligence, as it is working in Hong Kong to increase access to justice. CM, take it away. I see. Uh, thank you, Murray. Um, this is uh, my absolute privilege to be here uh, to, to be able to speak to you on a number of issues. Um, before I start, I must say that this is actually my very first UIA conference. Uh, I don't know why, but anyway, after all these years, this is my first time here. Uh, I didn't know how, how much I missed. It was a fabulous uh, conference, and I like the atmosphere, the size, and meticulous arrangement. So thank you for the organizer. Um, since this is my first time, I might as well give you a little bit background about the Law Society of Hong Kong first, um, before I talk about the AI impact. Um, the PowerPoint is up, okay. Um, so the Hong Kong Law Society, um, of course, you know, Hong Kong uh, is part of China now. Um, operates under the so-called one country, two systems. Namely, the socialist system in China does not apply to Hong Kong. Hong Kong continues with its own capitalist system. And more importantly, uh, for uh, lawyers' purposes, common law continues to apply in Hong Kong. Um, so <clears throat> for the Law Society of Hong Kong, it is a self-regulatory body. Um, Hong Kong is one of the few jurisdictions uh, that uh, inherited from England and Wales. We still have a split uh, lawyers system, uh, barristers and solicitors. So the, the Law Society of Hong Kong regulates all the solicitors branch um, of the legal profession. Um, we are a self-regulatory body, but we are also a professional uh, association, which will be relevant uh, when I talk about uh, how we regulate the use of AI later on. 
Um, this is our function. We are entrusted with statutory duty uh, to monitor the conduct of law firms and lawyers. So we issue licenses to uh, solicitors and law firms in Hong Kong. We have roughly 13,000 uh, members, 13,000 uh, uh, solicitors, uh, population in Hong Kong 7.5 million. Uh, we have roughly about uh, 930 law firms in Hong Kong. Uh, many of the international law firms have uh, branches in Hong Kong. We'll skip that. Okay, so um, AI. Um, of course, um, artificial intelligence is something the Law Society has been uh, looking into very closely. Um, I think the last panel has uh, uh, talked a lot about uh, the use of AI in the legal profession, whether it's document management, whether it's uh, electronic discovery, uh, or whether it's uh, translation, which I'll come back to this uh, particular point about interpretation and translation uh, in using AI. So we all know that. Um, the Law Society, of course, uh, we have uh, looked into the issue for a long time. We set up a InnoTech committee, which is chaired by uh, our Vice President, Mr. Uh, uh, Murray Nasir, who is sitting in the front row. Um, to look after how technology know-how can serve the legal profession better. Um, in fact, in, uh, back in 2017, the Law Society of Hong Kong, we actually have a roadmap how we actually go about taking advantages of the uh, technology. Um, uh, this is one of the examples that uh, the Academy of Law, which is the education arm of uh, the Law Society, we provide a lot of trainings to our members. Uh, we recently uh, organized a competition, uh, for, uh, sort of like a think tank competition, asking our young lawyers to come up with ideas uh, on using artificial intelligence. A lot of uh, good uh, ideas uh, generated, which uh, hopefully I'll have time to talk about later on. So, I said that the Law Society of Hong Kong is the regulator. Um, so the way we regulate our members is by way of prof uh, a professional guide of conduct. It's not law, but it has the effect that if you are in breach of this uh, 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 the, the, the guide, then it could r uh, render a disciplinary action. So we can take action against our members uh, in breach of the guide to professional conduct. So a very important uh, principle that uh, when a solicitor chooses to use technology in his practice, he has a duty to act competently. So this is the basic uh, principle which is in line with our common law duty. There are a number of different rules under our guide that uh, um, a solicitor must not act if uh, he is not competent in that particular area. And for example, if he uh, has accepted instructions on behalf of a client, his duty bound to carry out those instructions uh, do, uh, diligently with reasonable care and skill. So in other words, competency. So for now, the Law Society, we do not have any specific rules or uh, 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 guidance specifically on artificial intelligence. So a bit like uh, the previous uh, speakers said, it's a tool. The lawyers, the solicitor has an obligation to decide how to make good use of it. Uh, f further requirements, uh, competence involves uh, more than an understanding of legal principles. A solicitor, a lawyer, must know the capabilities and limitations of the tools and consider the risks and benefits of that particular technology. So again, this is the basic uh, obligation of our members. Um, Murray and uh, I think uh, Marie Amy talked about the, uh, uh, the Manhattan case uh, when the, a fate uh, judgment came up, uh, fate citations came up, and, uh, and the two uh, Manhattan lawyers were disciplined, obviously. Uh, and I think in the last panel, they also mentioned that there's a Texas uh, case afterwards, subsequent to the Manhattan case, that a Texas judge actually said that uh, lawyers can no longer, attorney in, in, the, in Texas cannot simply rely on ChatGPT in producing his uh, uh, skeleton argument. So this is a very, very interesting uh, development. Uh, we are following this closely. 
and, and maybe it's a good uh, juncture to uh, talk a little bit about China. I'm not a uh, practicing lawyer in China, but technology in China is uh, um, growing by day. Um, I visited um, a, an internet court in uh, Beijing. Uh, there are three internet courts in China, one in Beijing, one in Hangzhou. Hangzhou is basically Alibaba is based. A third one is in uh, Guangzhou, where Tencent is based. So there are three internet courts now in China, um, and uh, with a population of 1.4 billion in China, guess how many courts are there in China? 3,000. 3,000 courts in China. So very interesting when you talk about uh, access to justice. Uh, access to justice, uh, you know, uh, if a local court in a rural village in Yunnan province uh, as opposed to a court in Shanghai. Uh, again, if we have time, we can come back to this particular point. Um, but the uh, use of artificial intelligence in China is uh, amazing. Uh, we visited the internet court in Beijing. Um, they now handle a lot of uh, online um, disputes. And for now, um, it's only quite standard types of say and purchase, you know, uh, 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 type of scenario online. But they already have AI judges. Some of the judgments can be decided uh, by artificial intelligence, but now it's only limited to some uh, uh, some types of cases. Uh, the Supreme Court of China has already said that uh, you know uh, AI will not be applied to other cases, but only the internet cost will deal with some of them. But this is a very important trend. Um, on the contrary, the Hong Kong courts are. Uh, famous for its backwardness. Uh, we are still a very paper-based system in Hong Kong. Um, we've only started uh, electronic filing for uh, pleadings only last year, but only again for a small number of cases. Um, so Hong Kong is a very big contrast from China in terms of use of AI and technology. I think um, my last uh, point is uh, in Hong Kong, we are already thinking about remote hearing as well. Um, some use, use more technology uh, only in civil cases, and they have a lot of reservations about uh, using remote hearing for criminal cases. So I'm going to stop it here and uh, welcome any questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, CM. That was uh, interesting and a little bit different. Uh, you mentioned competency and diligence, which, by the way, are very important ethical uh, contents of both English and American practice and law. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, on the issue of competency, does that include competency in artificial intelligence, and can you rely on a more tech-savvy person in your law firm? And does that person have to be a lawyer, or can they be uh, a tech person uh, in order to meet your ethical obligations. Thank you, uh, Murray, for this uh, question. Um, I, I mentioned that uh, uh, the legal practice in Hong Kong is highly regulated, so we uh, license our lawyers, solicitors, and also legal clerks. So as lawyers, of course, you know, you uh, must be competent and you must use your judgment if you decide to delegate your power to a legal clerk, to a paralegal, to conduct uh, legal research through AI, for example. Uh, ultimately, ultimately, we look to our members, we look to our solicitors, uh, what, uh, why are you making this decision uh, and uh, whether the decision-making process is in accordance with our guide. So that's how we regulate for the time being. Um, I think I anticipate actually um, in the future we may need to have specific different uh, guidelines for the use of AI at some point. Thank you. Okay, we have a question right in the front here. Can we? And then this gentleman, you'll be second. I know you've had your hand up. Aldo up front and then the gentleman in the back. All right, we'll, we'll go with you in the back and then uh, go ahead. Jean-Pierre Beuil, l'ancien bâtonnier de Bruxelles. Merci pour vos lumières, votre dynamisme. J'avais deux questions à vous poser. La première, Madame la bâtonnière, vous avez rappelé tout à l'heure qu'on n'imagine pas aujourd'hui un avocat ne pas utiliser Internet. Est-ce qu'un avocat qui n'utilise pas l'intelligence artificielle, qu'elle soit ouverte ou fermée, 
commet un manquement. Est-ce qu'un de nos clients pourrait nous reprocher de ne pas avoir utilisé un outil d'intelligence artificielle qui nous aurait permis de trouver une jurisprudence ou une doctrine favorable et se faisant commettre une faute Est-ce que notre responsabilité est engagée C'est ma première question. Ma deuxième question, ces outils coûtent très cher. Est-ce que ce n'est pas un devoir de nos ordres et de nos barreaux d'investir dans l'intelligence artificielle au profit des avocats comme ils l'ont fait pour les bibliothèques qui sont à disposition des avocats, mais la bibliothèque est peut-être un peu dépassée. Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas un devoir de nos ordres et de nos barreaux d'investir avec nos cotisations dans ces outils-là et de les mettre à disposition des avocats. Vous avez cité un exemple que je ne connaissais pas de la conférence des bâtonniers de France qui investit là-dedans sur un outil de prédictivité. Ce serait intéressant qu'on en sache un peu plus. Merci. Mais, euh, vous l'avez dit, euh, moi, nous pensons qu'il faut qu'il y ait une mise à disposition de ces outils euh, de façon à créer une égalité. Euh, on le voit, nous, dans les cabinets d'avocats français, bon nombre de cabinets ont déjà mis en place ChatGPT euh, et sont en train de s'organiser. Maintenant, ce sont soit les plus gros, c'est très intéressant parce que ce, soit ce sont les plus gros cabinets d'avocats qui ont investi d'ores et déjà, soit des petites structures, notamment de jeunes, euh, qui ont déjà commencé à, à mettre en place, euh, je vous parlais de ce jeune avocat euh, qui a créé son robot pour répondre à ses clients tout en veillant à la sécurité juridique. Et, et nous sommes d'accord. Il doit y avoir... Nous, il nous appartient, à mon sens, à nous, institutions, ordinales et, et, et représentatives de, de, des avocats, effectivement, de veiller. Nous, ce, ça va être un des défis de la prochaine mandature du Conseil national des barreaux euh, français. Ça, c'est une évidence par rapport à, à, sinon, cette distorsion de concurrence qui est que certains se demandent. Maintenant, le dernier point et l'élément essentiel, il est dans la première partie de votre question, c'est la responsabilité civile professionnelle de l'avocat. Aujourd'hui, nous avons un système différent, d'ailleurs, du système anglo-saxon, qui est qu'on peut nous reprocher de ne pas avoir eu connaissance d'une décision de justice. Mais ça existait déjà avec les bases de données. Nous nous, nous retrouvons dans la même situation. Maintenant, euh, attention à ChatGPT, où nous savons que, attention, euh, attention aux algorithmes qui ont été mis en place, est-ce qu'ils sont sûrs, est-ce qu'ils sont fiables euh, Nous, c'est ce que nous demandent nos juridictions et nos ordres euh, de contrôler par rapport à la, et à, à la qualité des algorithmes utilisés. Parce que ça peut aussi être un système pour se planter, comme cet exemple que je, qui vous a été donné. Hein. Mais euh, ce devoir de compétence, il nous appartient, mais il nous appartient, nous avons l'avocat une obligation de moyens et de démontrer qu'il a mis en place tous les moyens possibles et il n'a pas une obligation de résultat, en tout cas en droit français. Mais je crois que c'est la même chose en droit belge, monsieur le bâtonnier. Et j'ai aimé votre suggestion que les bar associations uh, considèrent payer pour certains de ces équipements très équipement until until ils become Uh, more affordable. Now, this is a fabulous audience, really. We thank you. We have two more questions, and then we have two important announcements. So bear with us, and uh, we'll uh, continue. Aldo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mare. Aldo Bulgarelli, Verona, Italy. Uh, a preliminary question. Is it possible, in your opinion, uh, illustrious moderator and animator of the debate, to pose question uh, concerning uh, jurisdictions to which the four panels do not belong, in your opinion? I'm not sure I understood, but uh, normally... Because my question is to, only, for you. For uh, you, you are not a panelist, uh, you are a moderator and animator. That's uh, why the question. Uh, I only agreed to be the moderator, so I wouldn't have to answer questions, <laughs> but I'll try to answer anyway, yours. Anyway, <laughs> uh, de façon préliminaire, j'aimerais bien répondre un peu aux questions qui étaient posées par les bâtonnets de Bruxelles. Mais car je ne présente plus les, les barreaux italiennes, je laisse euh, le montage à Mario Napoli qui a fait ce monde du Conseil national des forêts. Pour moi, les réponses, c'est deux fois oui. C'est-à-dire, le premier avocat qui n'a pas considéré une décision importante, c'est responsable. Et deuxièmement, les barreaux doivent s'occuper de fournir, de oui, donner oui. aux avocats des moyennes telles pour euh, être efficaces aussi à niveau de l'intelligence artificielle. 
Uh, the question uh, to the non-panelist is, uh, I heard, Murray, that uh, uh, if I heard well, if I understand well, that in, in, a, in a US state, I can't remember which state, uh, some judges in criminal cases, you know that you make arrest, police arrest people, and then judge is able to fix an amount of money paying which uh, you come back to freedom, you be freed. Uh, and the decision was uh, influenced by artificial intelligence. I heard it happened. So just like to know if it happens again, it still uh, nowadays happens, and what to think about this. Yeah, I uh, think. Yes, and the second question was about a, a remark more than a question. Uh, when we think about artificial intelligence, you know very well that uh, interesting, a third question is for you, that uh, is based on the data that you put inside. So it's based on previous decisions. And one of the more impo most important principles in, in common law, but by us it's the same, if uh, you have some precedents, we are in the same sense. In, you are in, in, in England, Wales, they are binding precedents. But even in, in the, uh, England, Wales, the judge is enabled to change the decisions if the case deserves to do this. I wonder, and I'm sure the answer is not, how intelligence, artificial intelligence can do that. Because artificial intelligence is based on the previous decisions, so you will never change jurisprudence will never change, uh, never uh, uh, had an evolution in this case. And the question is for my uh, good friend, uh, the President uh, Chan, uh, uh, concerning what happens in China, continental China. We heard that you have already some decision rendered by a robot, by artificial intelligence. Is there any human control on it? Uh, and how about the appeal against these decisions who render it by? You go to another robot of more important uh, degree, or you go to a human being uh, making some control of this? Sorry of all, for all these questions. No. no, Aldo, for our next Congress, you'll be planning the uh, agenda. <laughs> but let me take a quick crack at the questions. First of all, you're talking about a decision on bail. That is, should the court rely on the person to come back and face trial after he has been arrested and accused, but he has not been tried? And yes, I have read about, and I think there is a role for artificial intelligence. You look at the circumstances of the individual, you look at the nature of the crime. Is it a violent crime? Is it a person that's likely to do violence to someone else? Is it a crime of property where some money has been stolen? Does the person have the ability to flee the jurisdiction and fly to uh, Verona, or is he or she more likely to be there? So I think there could be a role. Uh, in the end, the judge is still deciding based on what has been proposed by the uh, various uh, elements that go into the AI decision. Number two, the question of in a common law country, whether AI could be used to predict or to give a new decision. I certainly think it can, because uh, don't forget, there are two major elements to a common law decision. One is the law, what has happened before. The other is the set of facts. And lawyers in common law countries earn their bread by distinguishing why their facts are such that the old precedent no longer should apply. And I believe, and believe me, I'm not any kind of a knowledgeable expert on AI, but I'm pretty confident that AI would have the capability of taking into account newly entered data on new facts that are being presented and therefore be able to come up with a different legal result. Uh, I think the third question went to, to my left to Mr. Chan from Hong Kong. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, as I explained, there's only limited case in China that can be decided by an AI judge. Um, there are three specific uh, specialized court, called internet courts. Um, that the cases are very, very narrowly defined. Um, they do have an appeal system, as I understand. Um, so if you are not satisfied with the AI judgment, you actually go back to the normal uh, appeal procedures. 
Um, but very interestingly, when, uh, when I, I'm not an expert in this area, I, I went there, visited uh, twice, uh, that's it. But uh, basically, the plaintiff, the defendants, they don't need to actually attend the court. So everything will be submitted online. The hearing itself, it's, uh, like I said, will be conducted uh, online by the uh, AI judge. So uh, from the, the point you submit your claim till the judgment is delivered, you, you basically no need for physical attendance. Uh, but like I said, if you are not happy, then there's a procedure, as, as I understand it, for you to go back to the normal uh, judiciary for appeals. Human, human. Yeah, human ones, yeah. Our final question will come from uh, Mario, who did such a great job of presenting the uh, keynote speech yesterday. Mario. <laughs> um, je ne peux pas engager mon Conseil national à propos de la réponse à, à notre ami de Bruxelles, mais je partage totalement ce que Aldo vient de dire. Si je peux ajouter, l'intelligence artificielle regarde toujours le passé. Hmm? Au contraire, les avocats doivent regarder le futur, l'avenir. Et toute notre histoire, c'est une histoire d'un travail qui a changé les sociétés, a changé la jurisprudence, a, a changé la législation. Et nous ne pouvons pas renoncer à ça. Et, et puis, je partage totalement euh, votre opinion, madame la, la bâtonnière Peyron. Euh, Nous avons un gros problème de déontologie devant nous à propos de l'intelligence artificielle. Et je pense quelquefois à l'intelligence artificielle comme à, au barbecue. Hein? Alors, l'intelligence artificielle, c'est le grill. Hein? Mais la viande, c'est à nous de la choisir. Seulement, faisant ça, nous pouvons vraiment nous dire avocats. Okay, now I told you that we had two announcements, and before we get to them, I want you to join me in thanking this fabulous panel, and also for the role you as the audience. So we're thanking everybody for the panel. And now I'm gonna call Benedict Hahn, who for me is all things collective members and the International Senate, and she has an announcement. Je n'ai pas d'annoncement très long. C'est juste pour vous dire que, euh, en fin d'année dernière, Urquiola m'a demandé euh, de devenir secrétaire général du Sénat international des barreaux. Euh, et que, en cette qualité, donc, je m'adresse à vous euh, pour que vous puissiez m'identifier, tout simplement, euh, et m'adresser euh, tous les sujets que vous souhaiteriez que nous traitions dans le cadre du Sénat international des barreaux. Voilà, c'est tout ce que j'avais à vous dire. Et je passe la parole, du coup, à Rosa, qui, elle, a un vrai, une vraie annonce à vous faire. This is Rosa Isabel Pina Sastra. Okay. OK. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm one of the co-directors of the collective members, and uh, what I wanted to explain to you is that uh, we, many of you already know, but for those who don't know, the collective members committee, uh, together with the International Senate, we organize during the whole year different webinars and forums uh, with topics that interest to the bar associations. So. If uh, your bar association is here represented, or if not, if you um, uh, have a topic that you think that we should uh, organize a webinar or a forum that is in interesting for your bar, for your members, please come to me, to Murray. Uh, he's uh, uh, the other co-director of the uh, Collective Members Committee, or to Alfonso, Benedict, any of us, uh, we will be more than happy to receive your suggestions. So that was the first announcement. And the second, uh, we are working also in different projects. And um, the one that we are uh, working currently now is uh, on preparing a, a, a best practices guidelines for uh, helping uh, lawyers when they decide to uh, separate from a law firm, partners, lawyers, 
So uh, what uh, they, the law firm and the, and the lawyers, they should uh, do, or what are the best practices uh, to avoid conflict and to avoid uh, that this conflict goes to the um, president of, of the Bar Association and later on, if uh, it's not solved, to the Court of Justice. So we are working on that, and if any of the bar associations that are here represented, or if you know that your bar association has already this type of guidelines, please let us know as well, because so far, I think none of the bar association uh, that we have consulted have it. So that's why the UIA uh, is working on that, because we believe that this can help the bar associations and also the law firms. So that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosa. So thank you again, everyone. We are in recess until we meet again in Paris. See you then. Hey. <laughs>